So welcome. We are excited to have you with us today. We're going to be talking about a robust resident hall wireless deployment at the University of the Incarnate Word. And we're really, really excited today to have Neil Schroeder with us. Uh, he's on the line and we're going to be speaking with him and actually uh, getting a demo, a real live demo of UIW's network today. So my name is Emily. I'm on the product marketing team here at Meraki. And this is our agenda. Um, we have quite a bit to get through. What I'm going to do is quickly, as quickly as possible, move through a very brief high-level introduction of Cisco Meraki, um, sort of who we are and what we do, and very briefly give an overview of the technology architecture. And this is more just to set a little bit of context uh, for any of you who might be completely new to Meraki and to our solution. But what I want to do is spend the majority of our time today in the sort of live fireside chat with Neil. Uh, we are going to be relying quite heavily on you guys for your Q&A to spearhead this discussion. Um, this is sort of unplanned. I have a couple of questions for Neil, um, but we haven't uh, practiced this at all. This is real and live, and your opportunity to ask questions of a real live Cisco Meraki customer. Um, so my good friend and colleague, Tanya, is with us today on the call. She's going to be monitoring all of the Q&A that comes through. So please, please type your questions into that Q&A console, uh, or I guess panel on your WebEx console. And that's what we're going to use, actually, to help drive the discussion. Um, she's going to be uh, writing some questions on a board and, uh, and then showing me some questions from her screen so that we can ask Neil. Uh, or if you have questions for me, uh, I can try to ask those in real time as well. So that's how this is going to go. It's going to be slightly different from our usual webinar structure, but I think it'll be really fun and really interesting. So a little bit of house cleaning. Uh, we do have free access points for those of you who are qualified IT professionals on today's call. These are 11 AC Wave 2 access points. We're going to throw in a three-year cloud management license with it as well. So all the features and functionality that we talk about today will be available to you to test drive in your own environments. Uh, there are some terms and conditions, of course, so please do check eligibility details at that URL at the bottom of your screen. That's meraki.cisco.com slash free AP if you have any questions. And what we're going to do is we're going to reach out to you within the next week to confirm your eligibility and your shipping address. So please keep your ears open for a phone call or your eyes peeled for an email in your inbox from a Cisco Meraki rep uh, to reach out to and, uh, and chat about eligibility and make sure that we send your free access point to the right address. All right, without further ado, a little bit about us and who we are. If you're totally new to Cisco Meraki, what I'll say is we used to be our own startup. Uh, we were founded in 2006 by a research team from MIT, and essentially we invented cloud-managed wireless networking way back when. Um, we were dealing with a project called the RoofNet Project, so our founders were climbing on top of apartment building rooftops, affixing wireless access points to them, and trying to figure out how to manage those over the Internet. Uh, and that's how we got our start. And since then, we've branched out to basically have produced a, a full cloud-managed IT portfolio of products. So now we're not just a cloud-managed wireless solution. We also offer layer two and layer three access and aggregation switches, a full line of security appliances, VoIP phones, uh, an enterprise mobility management solution for iOS, Androids, Macs, and PCs, and we have a line of cloud-managed security cameras as well. So all of this equipment is designed to be 100% cloud-managed. We don't do any on-premise deployments of any kind, and what we, what we believe is actually the benefit of this architecture. Um, there's actually a couple of benefits uh, that are worth pointing out. The first is definitely scalability. Um, there's no bottlenecking, right? We're, you're not going to be bottlenecked by having to deploy wireless LAN controllers. You're not going to have to pay for redundant wireless LAN controllers. You can scale or shrink rapidly. Um, it's literally just plugging Meraki gear into the internet, into power, uh, and having it access our cloud. Uh, where it can get its configuration settings 
uh, and run with those. Um, there's a lot of reliability and security built right into the back end. We've sort of offloaded that for you. Um, our cloud, and by cloud I mean our data centers that are deployed all over the world, uh, are highly available. There's a lot of redundancy built in, um, a lot of uh, measures in place in case of any sort of catastrophic failures or downtime in one data center uh, to sort of highly, um, quickly uh, sort of hot, hot swap over to another. Uh, we have a 99.99% uptime service level agreement. We undergo daily penetration testing um, and uh, all sorts of security audits at our data centers. And they are SSAE 16 certified. I believe that was formerly SAS 70 certified. Uh, and we use what we call an out-of-band control plane. So that means that no end user traffic ever passes through our cloud. Um, so that's kind of what's being uh, described in that diagram over there on the left. Essentially what you do is you receive Meraki equipment, whether it's an access point, a switch, a security appliance, a phone, a camera. Uh, you, again, like I said before, you plug it into power, plug it into the internet. What will happen is there are various ways to either uh, then start configuring your gear, or if you've pre-configured your gear, like I said before, uh, it'll grab its configuration settings from the cloud and run with those. Um, but essentially, it'll initiate a secure connection back to our cloud. Uh, and by secure, I mean it's encrypted twice, first with proprietary encryption and then again with SSL. And that connection is small. It averages about one kilobit per second per device. And the reason for that, again, is we use uh, that out-of-band control plane. So we don't see or store end user traffic. We don't see the contents of your website or the contents of your documents or anything like that. That goes wherever it was intended to go. We are simply capturing management and monitoring statistics uh, and a little bit of metadata so that we can present the information that you're gonna see when we get to the dashboard demo. So I would encourage all of you to check out uh, the URL at the bottom of your screen. It's meraki.cisco.com slash trust. In case you have any questions, we try to be as transparent as possible. We put a lot of good information up there about the security in our data centers and our security policies uh, and a few other things. So I uh, would definitely check that out. We are, in fact, trusted by many, many, many higher education campuses. This is just a small smattering of them here. Um, and you can see some uh, quite a few varieties of, of different universities and colleges here. Um, so we do actually... Um, do very well being deployed in, in anything from small deployments to very, very large deployments, uh, anything spanning from, uh, you know, a couple of access points to over 10,000 access points for a given uh, network. And especially if you have a distributed campus or, or a distributed environment where you have to manage multiple sites or maybe multiple buildings on a, on a big campus, uh, you'll see from the demo and, and hopefully from the conversation that we are uh, quite easy to deploy, manage, configure, maintain. Um, so without further ado, what I'd like to do is actually uh, get Neil Schroeder uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the line and, uh, and introduce him. Neil, are you, are you there? Yeah, hey, everybody. You hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Um, Great. I'm wondering if you could just introduce yourself, uh, give us a quick introduction to UIW sure. uh, and some of, some of the pain points uh, and, and rationale for why you were looking to um, uh, sort of revamp your your wireless. Sure. Well, you know, I guess hello to all. I see there's quite a few people out there. I'm, uh, you know, super happy to uh, share our experience. You know, I was uh, sitting in the, in a seat similar to a lot of you. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have a Meraki uh, webinar to to attend, so I'm trying to pay it forward a little bit. Just share some some real world experience, uh, just in, in the way of, of interaction. My title here is Senior Director of uh, Digital Infrastructure and User Services. So clearly that portfolio uh, contains networking and then servers and a variety of other things. Um, our university, the University of the Incarnate Word, we are a, a, a private uh, Catholic school uh, in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, we are, as you can see by the numbers here, around 11,000 uh, enrolled globally, 1,900 staff. You, you guys can see all that. Um, and with with all of that, uh, we are a heavy com commuter campus. So we, we have 13 residence halls, um, but again, a vast majority of our, our students are commuters. Um, but we did run into a problem. You know, we have a, a three-person network team. It, you know, it's either 
plenty of people are not nearly enough, I guess, depending on who you ask. You know, I tend to be in the uh, probably not enough people. Uh, in we, this small team, we were asked, I, I got here about a year ago, we were initially asked to uh, review our residential network uh, setup. Uh, for any of those of you that have residential halls, uh, I think it, it was quite in vogue to outsource uh, ResNets uh, years ago. That was still uh, something that we had employed here at UIW. Uh, the challenge was we are coming to the end of a, a six-year contract uh, with a certain provider. Uh, oh, there, there we go. Yes. <laughs> uh, you know, and it was a very interesting arrangement. Uh, in, we sat down with the provider, tried to renegotiate a, a contract, uh, but we were not really happy with uh, the setup and, and how that was managed overall. Uh, you know, it, it had served its purpose, but the, the equipment was, was out of date. Um, we still had a support burden, but really no, as they say, their visibility. We, we were kind of at the mercy of, of this provider, a lot of out of the blue calls. and. Um, so, again, we weren't strongly happy. We were trying to negotiate a, a, a better deal. Um, but as part of our due diligence, we started exploring, uh, you know, different solutions. I'd had some exposure to, to Meraki in previous roles, um, and, and we did some testing and found out that, uh, you know, it, it would definitely meet our needs, uh, even compared to we are, I guess, in full disclosure, I should have thrown some, some technical nerdery out there. Um, we are a, a Cisco shop uh, through and through, all Cisco gear, um, you know, very traditional setup. Um, so we had looked at the, the standard Cisco solution. Um, we looked at Meraki, uh, and, and again, we looked at the provider, but, you know, the Meraki solution, as you can see here, the, the total cost of ownership and savings was pretty phenomenal. You know, the, the price for access point and licensing is, a, is very straightforward. Um, and again, I, I think we'll look we'll look at it a little bit um, going forward. But it, it really was, uh, you know, hands down a, a great option for us. The, the other challenge, you know, we we were really up against um, a very very short time window. So that that, that was the other thing we had to um, maybe we could hit the the next slide, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we you know we looked we looked at a traditional Cisco footprint with we were going into 13 different buildings. Uh, you know, lots of, uh, you know, kind of nuanced cases, and we were trying to figure out how many more controllers might we need. We knew we were, we were going to be four or 500 access points deep just to get everything done the, the way we wanted to. Uh, the, the Cisco solution by itself, which serves us very well in other areas, the, the time and level of effort to get that done would not have been uh, feasible for us. We actually were in a position where we had to make a decision. We went from uh, really initial investigation, late February, early March, when this kind of was, was laid out, um, to we had to have full implementation done uh, by the 24th of July. So we had a very short time frame, and that's, you know, completely replacing, uh, you know, all every single AP that, that was already existing, as, long, as well as uh, most of the switching infrastructure. I, I didn't mention that. That that's, was all standard Cisco stuff uh, and, and still remains Cisco. Um, but what we saw with Meraki is, we, you know, without having controllers, we were able to get in. I mean, once you put an AP up, it's, it's on the wire. You're able to start, you know, using it right away. It's, it's already configured. Um, we actually, because it was so simple and we had so much savings, we actually were able to, you know, we were, we were a team of two. That was, it was part of that. We added an additional person that could really respond and, and you know, help support the residential networks. Uh, now, now he's listening on the, the distant end here. Uh, you know, I got to find other stuff for him to do just to keep him busy. It's, it's been going well. We, we, we can talk about that a little bit. Yep. Um, but it, again, with bringing everything into the Meraki dashboard has made it, you know, extremely easy. Um, we, we just did a security update. You, know, you can push all your updates really from any you know, web-enabled computer. Uh, and honestly, as we say here, the, the um, reporting and analytics, the ease of that, and I've given this feedback to anybody at Cisco that will listen, you know, that should be embedded across the product line because it's just, it's just that good. It's very quick. It, it, it's detailed. You know, if you're a real hardcore data nerd, you, you, know, you might be missing one little thing, but for really 99% of application, we can get right to what we want to get to, uh, you know, without issue. Awesome. 
Okay, please. please. Not, not to interrupt you. I, I did want to get a few little questions in here. Um, so uh, we want to move forward and definitely have you give us a little bit of an overview of how you've deployed Meraki. But one of the um, questions that we often hear when we're on webinars is, you know, sort of how do you make the case for um, for Meraki to your management? We have some concerns sometimes about the licensing model. Um, and for those of you who may not know, the way that it works is you purchase Meraki hardware, maybe that's an AP, uh, and then you buy a license to operate the hardware, and that can be anywhere from one to 10 years. And for the duration of that license, it's, it's sort of an all-you-can-eat enterprise license. You get all access to all the features and functionality in the dashboard um, that are available to you. Uh, you get your enterprise support included. Um, you get access to all the new features and firmware that we push out. Uh, and so uh, people are often very curious about that and was wondering yeah. if, if that had been an issue for you at all or you had any we, concerns about that going in. We didn't really see it as, as an issue. I think that, you know, the Meraki uh, hardware is competitively priced. And I think even looking at Cisco or other providers that I've worked with, you know, there's traditionally uh, a support and maintenance cost to bear there as well. Um, so for us, it, it really, in fact, it, it really simplified it because I, I tend to find some of the smart net and, and the different licensing with Cisco can get a little confusing. That's probably just me, uh, but, but that was a bit of a struggle. Meraki, you know, once you're paid up, you're just good to go. That's all there is, and everything's right at your fingertips. So you aren't running into, wait, I need an, another license for this piece of, of, you know, the firewall or, or whatever, which you tend to see with, with some of the other uh, mm -hmm. equipment. So really, for us, it wasn't a problem. And I know, again, the way we had a structure, if you buy so many years, you know, you may get extra years. You know, and I think looking out five, six, or seven years, uh, again, the cost model still works, and I'm not sure where we'll be at in seven years. We'll probably be at it again. Okay. We have a, a couple of questions coming in, too, from our listeners. One of them was, Neil, how did you ensure proper coverage, and have you run into any growth or coverage issues in your deployment with Morocco? Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, I want to tell you we did a, a really awesome, uh, deep, wireless survey. <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't. Um, you know, part of it due to the timing, um, we, we did a little bit of a, uh, I, I don't know, kind of best effort on where we had already had placement uh, with our prior solution. That had been vetted pretty well over time, and the gear was very old, so we knew going in with the Wave 2 um, AC stuff, we were going to get better coverage, better throughput. Um, so we we basically put it out. We did an awful lot of testing, uh, just you know, for edge to edge, every room, going through, making sure we got the right kind of uh, uh, speeds in signal strength. Uh, so really, again, it, it was more relying on what we had done before and kind of building on that foundation. We did overbuy just a little bit to give us some flexibility. And one thing that was also a little unique, we we really were walking ourselves out of the the wired world. We just had very little usage. Uh, although there's still a fair amount, that's where we, we really, the solution with the MR, uh, the 30 access point has four wired ports in it. Uh, so that actually got people, uh, the, the gamers and the guys that actually wanted to see a wire plugged into a port, that scratched their edge. So we ended up uh, in back to school time, working with our residents' life people, making sure that the hardcore gamers that, that wanted ports were placed in a room that had uh, the, the MR30 and or we ended up adding a few after the fact and kind of uh, retuning from there. Okay. Sorry, that was a long way around of uh, uh, going through that. No worries. And I'm, I'm going to ask one more question and then let you get back to the slides and we'll get back to the questions. Um, but someone was asking, how did you handle higher density areas? We're looking at coverage in student unions where a larger yep. number of people will be congregating in a common area. Yeah, we, we focused a lot on uh, using the, uh, the the 42s, which I, actually it's on the slide here. Um, you know, depending on how many people you're looking at, uh, they can handle quite a bit of load. I mean, we've got dozens, you know, dozens and dozens. I, I, I should ask Josh what the max is. I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, but we haven't run into a situation where uh, the density in the residence halls you know, and, and in full disclosure, it's not like we're running it in a, um, uh, you know, like a ballroom that there's a thousand people simultaneously connected. But we found that be, between that the MR42 was able to handle our common spaces very well uh, without issue. Cool. 
Oh, cool. And I'll just put in a plug. If you if you're looking for very high density or mission critical um, high density indoor deployments, we also have the MR 52s and 53s, um, which are which are uh, able to handle slightly higher loads than the 42. But a lot of people love the 42. So um, awesome. Thank you, Neil. I was wondering if you if you don't mind just uh, sort of walking us through what your deployment looks like. Actually, now that we've got the slide up. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, we've kind of talked a little bit. We we were heavy on. Um, the the MR thirty, which is a smaller access point, uh, you know, I don't know, it's, it's it's very compact, but again, all wave two, it has four data ports at the bottom of it. We use that extensively in, in the student rooms. Um, again, going off kind of our, our prior coverage, we, we certainly don't have an access point in every room, uh, but we have very you know fairly dense coverage on the floors, and again, steering the wired kids towards the or students towards the the rooms that already had that. And we, we relied on the MR42s to cover it, just as we talked about, common use areas, um, a little bit more of the, uh, just where we knew we were gonna have more people congregating. Um, and again, laid in on a, a pretty standard Cisco switching uh, infrastructure. What we did is we, we built uh, a, a, some new SSIDs. We're also in the process of migrating that university-wide, but we lined all that up to just be UIW employees, students, and guests, pretty pretty standard issue. Um, the only thing we did do that's a little different, and I'm sure it'll come up, is we've made another network um, called UIW uh, ResNet Limited, but what that was for is all the headless devices that we knew we'd be dealing with, things like game consoles, printers, et cetera. Um, and we basically uh, tied that in with ICE, and as we have on here, that's how we're doing the authentication on the back end, just with their, any device they can, uh, you know, you can get onto with a browser or it's w, uh, WPA2 compatible. Uh, you can just log right in with your uh, university credentials, no problem. But again, those headless devices, you basically go self-register through a portal, um, and that gives you access for the duration of the school year. And then we're planning on flushing that at the end of the year, and students will basically re-register. So if they want to play their uh, uh, Xbox or, uh, you know, PlayStations. Cool. Um, and then one question that I wanted to ask, uh, just because I noticed that you are using this kind of dual deployment of uh, Meraki Wireless with the Cisco uh, infrastructure. Uh, have you seen any issues with the dual deployment, um, or you know what? Ha uh, can you can you explain sort of like? No, I mean it's in general. Now you know I'd be lying if I there was a little bit of the issue wasn't with Meraki, but the the Cisco ICE product that that could be a whole other webinar. Um, as we were moving away from ACS, we just said, hey, we're going all in with ICE. Um, and that was kind of a new journey for us. And, and that was a little bit of a hiccup, but that's that's kind of a separate story. As far as the integration with Cisco, with Cisco switching, with ICE, and actually moving, because our, our residence halls are on, all on Meraki. Most of the rest of our, our academic buildings and other areas are uh, all on Cisco, and students are moving in between. It's just, you know, the, the SSIDs are the name the same. They move between with with impunity, so it, it's actually worked uh, quite well for us. Cool. Uh, and then we were getting a couple of questions about um, uh, what the um, what kind of uh, material was be, is your are the walls are they are they concrete are they wood? Generally? Yeah, it's. I'd say we have a, a mix. I mean, we have some buildings that are older with very dense construction, you know, bricks and concrete block, um, these kind of, kind of, that type of stuff. And actually even some of most of our newer facilities, there is an awful lot of uh, uh, concrete. So, so and I know where you're driving with that. That's why we, we really had to be deliberate in how we did our AP placement. Just because of that, you're gonna run into a lot of uh, signal attenuation. But I will say that the coverage was actually a little better than, than we anticipated. You know, the signaling was, was getting uh, where it needed to get without too many, uh, you know, too many, I guess, workarounds. Uh, but yeah, it, it's a mix of, of really everything. Okay. And then one other question um, before we get on to the live demo uh, was from the residence halls, do students have access to the production or academic network and how do you separate them if so? Yeah, so, so right now they're, they're on a different subnet um, and we do, uh, they do have access. Uh, that, that's kind of phase two for us is looking at how we were going to re uh, 
segment. We, we've built, you know, everything from the, the different SSIDs, there, there's a, an entirely different subnet that, that we're hanging them all off of. Um, we have some more ideas on, I guess, more uh, aggressive segmentation, but right now, because of the way some of our other services are built, they do have access uh, straight back through to a variety of different, you know, on on campus resources. But there's other protections in for some of the ERP and all that as well. So um, that is definitely a concern and a consideration. Um, we try to lay the foundation for it, but the reality was some of the rest of our infrastructure or in applications and services weren't quite ready to uh, for us to do anything too aggressive. So uh, we have this what's next slide. I don't know if, if you want to add anything else here. Um, yeah, on. I mean, I, I, you know, we had talked and we have looked at both the uh, the switching solution and the the uh, the security cameras. I think we're going to see more, even on the AP side, we're actually going to look at some of the, the academic areas deploying it. it. It's just, it's that easy. It has been a huge time saver. I think as we continue to migrate across the, uh, the institution, we're going to spend less time babysitting all kinds of controllers in, in the traditional Cisco model um, versus, you know, with Meraki, it's it's just dead simple. So that's kind of what we're looking at. Um, yeah, and, and the guy we hired, I've got Josh, you know, he's starting to help out with the, the firewall and some other areas where we just needed a little bit more dedication. The, the reality is, and, and I, I guess I didn't mention, I mean, the solution from the, it was fairly easy to get in place. We had a couple of minor just technical things from when we first got going, but the reality is that the trouble calls are, are almost non-existent, and there really aren't any related to, uh, I would say, the infrastructure as much as just either user error training or traditional, like, hey, I can't get on the wireless, but it's a password problem or something else. Mm -hmm. It's it's really been a rock-solid infrastructure as, as far as that goes. Awesome. I'd love to hear that. Um, so we are getting a ton of questions in, and I definitely want to uh, give some time to address those. I do want to make sure, though, that we at least briefly go through the live demo. Um, so I think some of these questions might actually be answered by the live demo. I think we have one that was asking how do you deal with peer-to-peer -peer traffic, um, which we can very easily talk sure. about. Yep. So, um, so again, everyone, Neil has graciously allowed us to demo his network. Um, Neil, again, if there's anything in particular that you want to talk through or highlight, feel free to interrupt me at any point. I'm just going to give a very quick, very high level, uh, less than like what we would do in a normal uh, intro to wireless webinar overview, um, just to let people see some of the menu options and, and what, the, what the dashboard looks like, uh, and then we will dive right back into questions and uh, wrap up maybe about five till. Okay. Perfect. All right. So, um, so what we're looking at here, this is Neil's network. Uh, UIW, um, and uh, I zoomed in um, basically uh, to his geographic area, but when you log in to uh, dashboard.meraki.com from any internet accessible device anywhere in the world you happen to be, uh, and if you were Neil, you would log in, you would get dumped into this sort of overview where you can immediately start getting some health and connectivity stats about your various network deployments, wherever they happen to be, and if you're managing, uh, you know, tens or hundreds or thousands of networks, you could expand this out and see them all listed here and do things like sort by usage or get very quick snapshots of network health and connectivity. So a little uh, red sliver might mean a reboot or some downtime. And what you can do is you can dive into any of these networks just by clicking on them. Uh, so uh, this is the, I guess, the resident network here. Uh, and you can see all of the, uh, the different access points deployed. And if we come into this client's view, um, this is where you start getting a lot of the data and statistics about who's using what on your network, what types of client devices are connecting, uh, and, and what you can do is see, for example, start slicing and dicing this data by time frame, and we're looking at the last week, and we're looking at all of our clients, and we can see that almost 6,000 unique client devices were connecting to Neil's network, and here they, here they all are listed out, uh, and you can see some of them are currently online, that's what that green icon means, some of them we're online within the last week, but currently aren't. And you know, you can do some fun stuff like who's online, who's wireless, which I think might be all of your clients, uh, and let's just find the max, right? So we know that 89 devices right now are connected uh, to one of the wireless SSIDs in Neil's network, um, and here they are. Or perhaps you know, we wanted to look for the iOS devices, or perhaps we wanted to look for 
Windows devices. Uh, so we can do that. And the beauty is that right away you can select these devices, you can apply policies to them if you want automatically, but it's a very quick and dirty way of um, finding different devices in your network. And then you can dive into individual devices or select them like I did and apply policies. And this is called uh, client device fingerprinting. We uh, sort of as a cloud managed solution keep track of the operating systems and device types on the back end for you and we update this list. So you don't ever have to manually download uh, some kind of file to, to get this level of visibility. It's just innate in our system. And we also have what we call application fingerprinting as well. So we are, have algorithmically classified and tagged hundreds of applications uh, and here they all are. And so you can right away sort by usage if you wanted to and see for a given time frame, again, for a given network and, and uh, sort of subset of client devices, who's using what on your network, right? Where is your bandwidth going? Um, and so, you know, we can see Netflix is here, uh, Xbox, uh, you know, if, if you were worried about peer-to-peer -peer traffic, that would show up here as well if it was here. Uh, and what you can do is you can just, you know, dive into any of these uh, and very quickly get a sense for, uh, a, well, a little bit of information about the application, first of all, but then very quickly get a sense for who is consuming the most. Uh, so, you know, perhaps if one of these users was, you know, 90% of the rule, we'd know that there's one particular user that's really using a lot of Netflix, and maybe that was causing some trouble on our residential network. And, it, you know, if that were the case, you know, we could dive into any single one of these devices uh, and get a little bit more information about it. Um, so this one doesn't appear to be currently connected. Let's go find, let's just go find any client device who's currently connected. Let's take this guy. Uh, and you can dive in and you can see for a specific client device, uh, whether it's connected, you can see which wireless network it's connected to. Uh, you can even see the access point it's connected to. You can get information about its signal strength, some details about the capabilities of this device, uh, and also a sense for where it is consuming bandwidth and what applications. And you could even expand this out, get a little bit more uh, detail. And of course, I'm not a, an admin on Neil's network, so I can't see certain things that are uh, blurred for privacy reasons, but right away we can see which applications a given client device is using uh, and in sort of what sort of bandwidth capacities over a given time frame. Again, you can slice and dice this in various ways. And if I needed to, if I needed to come in, uh, I could block this user. I could apply a group policy to this user if I had some defined. I could uh, even apply policies based on which wireless network they're connecting to, right? So, you know, maybe I want to block them from one particular uh, network and uh, allow them for another and apply policies for, for different things that way. So I can do all of those things and I can actually come in and even start troubleshooting. So if there were issues with, say, connectivity and this client was having trouble connecting to our wireless network, I could very quickly find the client, come in, make sure it's got the right IP address, it's on the right VLAN, I could ping the client, uh, remotely just to make sure it's accessing the internet. Again, coming in and checking the application usage, making sure everything looks okay here. And I could check the event log for the client or even start a remote packet capture and save the packet capture to uh, you know, a PCAP file and look at it in Wireshark later if I wanted to. Um, and if the client looked okay, you know, I mean, this is green. It seems like we have some fairly decent signal strength here. What I can start to do is then come in and actually dive up into the access point itself and start uh, sort of getting a sense for whether the access point might be having some trouble. Um, so what we can see, we're actually looking at an MR30H, and this is a very typical uh, configuration page. And you guys will see this when you set up your free access points, but very typical configuration page for Meraki access points. This one's slightly different because it's an MR30H, so we're seeing the ports. Um, but generally speaking, uh, this looks the same uh, no matter which access point we're looking at. We could find ones perhaps that aren't MR30Hs if we really wanted to. Uh, and say like a 42, just to show you. And dive into a 42 and you can see, um, again, very similar. And what you're seeing is the sort of health and connectivity stats of the AP. So you can see what kind of AP it is, which wireless uh, SSIDs it's broadcasting and on which channels and some network information about the AP. Now you can go and tag your access points too and this is extremely useful uh, if you want to do things like use SSID availability to sort of pop up different 
SSIDs in different geographic locations based on AP tag at certain schedules or times, or if you want to really granularly get into nitty-gritty uh, location analytics type um, uh, data uh, comparisons, because all of our APs come with built-in location analytics, which uh, maybe we'll look at really quickly if we have time, but uh, you can tag your APs however you see fit. Uh, and then again, you're getting information about the AP, right? So uplink traffic, historical data, again, for given timeframes that might be of interest to you. So you can check and see perhaps if that client was having connectivity issues, was the AP up? Were there any sort of chunks of downtime? Uh, are there any sort of abnormal usage patterns? And you can check historically, you know, who's been using the most bandwidth on this, on this particular AP. And again, you could dive into any of these client devices to drill down a little bit more. You could look at the event log for the access point. We have uh, live tools. So for all of our gear, uh, the tools will be slightly different depending on which, which piece of Meraki equipment you have. For example, our switches have a, a live cable test tool that will let you test every twisted pair inside of a, an Ethernet cable to check and make sure it's OK. Um, here with the access points, these are the live tools available to you. And you could do things like remotely reboot the device or check its ARP cable, that kind of stuff. Um, or you can come into our RF analytics page and uh, either in real time or up through the last month for a given radio, uh, come in and check and see what was happening on the AP. There are certain times when it looks like this access point was uh, undergoing what we call AP events. So those might be uh, sort of auto RF channel changes or uh, there might be some indications of interference. But what's beautiful about this is that at the exact moment that this AP event was happening, you can come in and sort of see Okay, well, what was the active client count? You know, were we seeing any non-802.11 interference, any kind of uh, abnormal usage, that kind of thing. So uh, there's quite a lot of analytics and tools built right in to the wireless uh, functionality and, and into the dashboard and everything from going in and granularly configuring radio settings, perhaps if there's a sort of high density scenario or some interference um, that you're seeing, uh, you know, you can kind of come in uh, and get a sense for um, coverage areas and, and zoom into your access points if you want. Click on any given access point and do things like uh, set its channel, set its power, um, channel width. You can set, uh, you know, whether or not you're allowing DFS or not, if you uh, happen to not be near lots of airports and ports and that kind of thing, and enable automatic power reduction. Uh, or you can even come in and get live uh, RF spectrum data, which can be really useful if you are trying to uh, troubleshoot and deal with uh, sort of high density scenarios and auditoriums or stadiums and things of that sort. Uh, and, you know, again, you can kind of switch back and forth between the different radios. And I should mention uh, that all of our current access points uh, and new access points at this point uh, for now are a um, sort of what we call a quad radio architecture. So you get that 2.4 gigahertz radio, you get the 5 gigahertz 11 AC wave 2 radio, you get uh, the sort of dual band uh, third radio that's dedicated to intrusion prevention and detection as well as our sort of auto RF channel management functionality, and then you get uh, an integrated Bluetooth VLE radio. Um, so at a very high level, that's, that is just a few of the troubleshooting things that you can do. Um, setting up group policies in, is incredibly easy, and again, everything sort of GUI-based. Setting up wireless SSIDs is incredibly easy. Um, you can actually set up guest Wi-Fi in like 30 seconds, depending on what kind of settings you want. Um, and of course, we have location, uh, oops, let's just say location analytics, both in sort of a heat map view. Uh, and let's see, this was funny. Uh, well, we can at least look at it this way, both in sort of a heat map view and also um, in sort of this view where you can kind of compare and contrast for given time frames uh, across different wireless networks if you want, uh, just to get some information about things like uh, visit rates and dwell times and repeat visits, which might be useful um, perhaps if you want to see if like a new wing of a library is getting the foot traffic you expect or if you want to see at what times or on what days you're getting a lot of activity in certain parts of campus. Um, now, in the interest of time, because we have tons of questions coming, I am going to cut the demo short. Was there anything, Neil, that you really wanted to go over? You know, I, I think you did a great job, you know, hitting the high points. <laughs> in fact, I learned a few more things, so I, I, awesome. I can't wait till afterwards. Awesome. 
Okay, so what I want to do, I want to make sure that we get to um, to everybody's questions because they are now coming in quite quickly. Uh, so how do you deal with P2P? We can see we could very quickly um, apply a group policy. Uh, one question that was coming up, do you have any outdoor access points from Meraki deployed or are you considering those? You know, we've considered it. We don't have any at this point. Uh, okay. Most, just the way that the setup is, you know, it's indoor heavy, but yeah, no outdoors. But real quick on the, the, the P2P, I mean, we, did, we actually, I guess, could have showed that, that the, you know, setting up a layer seven rule is dead simple. Um, so we did a, a P2P block at the, we do obviously at the, the, the boundary of the network and all that, but mm -hmm. we actually are blocking P2P specifically uh, with the layer seven firewall. We're not really doing anything else but that. So we're just, we just said, and we told our students, hey, we're, we're going to find every which way we can to uh, block P2P. So we, we have that block in there, but, it, but it's very easy to, to do it and then deploy it. And so the, just to show you guys the page really quickly where you would do that, um, you know, if you wanted to outright block at layer seven, um, you could come in and literally you could say peer to peer, we're going to block all peer to peer and you would, you would name this policy something. Uh, you can pick from these groups. Uh, if, you, if you don't see what you're looking for, um, there are ways to uh, sort, of, sort of customize this or if you want to prioritize or throttle traffic. Same deal. Um, you can do custom expressions or come in. Again, we've algorithmically classified tons of different websites. Uh, so you can outright block, you can outright uh, throttle, or you can outright prioritize very easily. Um, yeah, and it, it, the, the rate limiting, just from our, uh, you see the per client bandwidth list there. That, that reminded me when we first started, I was like, uh, I mean, we, we upgraded our internet pipe, but I was like, all right, let's, um, for the students, you know, let's block them down to like, uh, you know, 200 megs just in case, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, is, so we played with that. The reality was we really didn't need to do it, but it was, it was that easy. I kept having Josh back it off, like, all right, they're not plugging the pipe, so, you know, let them, let them go as fast as they want. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, so other questions. Uh, what, someone was wondering, in your experience, how many rooms uh, do, do the MR30Hs cover? Ooh. Um, let me, I'm going to flag one of my technical guys. Let's do another one. I want to just make sure I get that one right. Okay. Uh, do you block students from specific domains? Not with the Meraki solution. Okay. Uh, other question is, which I could probably answer, is how easy is it to set up a splash page? It's very, very easy. Um, if you go into access control and find the SSID for which you want to uh, deploy a splash, splash page, Meraki has some uh, built-in hosted splash functionality. So, for example, if we were going to take, say, this guests page here, uh, all you would do is you, at some point when you're configuring the SSID, you decide if you want a click-through splash page uh, where you can set up terms and conditions and upload a, an image and, and some text. Uh, or if you want a splash page to use for additional types of authentication, perhaps to Active Directory or Facebook or Google. Uh, but once you've clicked on that and you hit save, what you can do is then come in to this splash page page. <laughs> uh, and you can literally, again, you'll have the option to find that SSID that you just configured. And of course, you don't, you don't have it set up for this SSID, so this is all grayed out. But you can see you can come in here. Uh, you can choose different colors and customizations and themes. Uh, you could decide whether uh, you're going to redirect to a different URL, uh, put a message up, put a logo up, decide how often people are going to see the splash page functionality and things of that sort. So it's, it's extremely easy to get that uh, set up. Um, other questions. Uh, have you looked at all at our MX security appliances was one question. Uh, you know, we did. Uh, you know, unfortunately, during this effort, we also had another initiative going with uh, upgrading our, our uh, to the Cisco Firepower line. We haven't done much more with the MX at this point. It, we, we did it like that. We just weren't in a position to um, add that to the, the fray. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, one other question was, um, did you see any challenges uh, as far as continued service for both systems during your transition period? Um, not, not necessarily. I, you know, I think, uh, we were kind of running, uh, in parallel, but we were, we were lucky. Oh, excuse me. 
we were lucky in that a lot of the residence halls were on, there was very little use over the summer. So we were able to cut entire buildings over and kind of work with residents life so that we didn't have a situation where we were trying to totally back into a building. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, they were running uh, like dual ops. So we, we were, we tried to be very deliberate in setting that up and we really didn't run into any issues. I mean, it was pretty straightforward. Um, I'll field this one, which is, what is the ETA for Meraki to be FIPS certified? Um, I, we get this question a bit, uh, and when I've talked to folks on the product team, the answer is that there's, we are, we are going to probably not uh, target uh, deployments, you know, sort of defense or military, things of that sort that need FIPS compliance, um, partly because it, we feel like we're actually uh, in a better and more responsive position to actually very quickly deploy security updates uh, and, and change up things when we need to from a security perspective by not being FIPS complied because apparently there's a very long process that you have to go through to then get recertified and re, um, uh, recertified for FIPS when you make uh, significant changes uh, that way. And so uh, we're actually able to very quickly deploy security changes and updates um, that I think would be tough if we were going to try to be 100% FIPS certified. So unfortunately, there is no roadmap for that. Uh, Neil, other question for you. Uh, you mentioned it briefly, but can you go over again how students register devices that can't do WPA2 Enterprise log on, for example, game consoles? Yeah, so, so we have a, um, it's basically a Mac authentication. There's a, we use Cisco ICE as sort of the a network access control platform. We, we got Safe Connect and looked at other ones, but we, we decided to go with ICE. So there's multiple ways to, to platforms to do it with. But on ICE, we, we basically set up a website where uh, the students simply log in with their credentials. Uh, and they have to, the, the hardest part is they have to know the MAC address for the device. But we put out instructions, you know, here's how you find it in Xbox and, and whatever. In fact, usually if we get a call on the help desk, that it'd be something kind of weird like that. So it's really, it's just a, you, you log into this web page, you, you put in a couple pieces of information, most critically, you can name it and put, put a few things on there. Um, you put the MAC address in, hit submit, boom, uh, and they're good to go at that point. Cool. Uh, let me just um, come back to, so one other question, how did you handle wireless printers that advertise at the 2.4 gigahertz? Uh, yeah, that's that's a great one. Um, you know, we try to discourage it as much as possible. Um, we didn't have a lot. We, we have had a few printers that people have tried to connect. Um, I don't want to tell you we had some great solution to it. We've just tried to discourage students. We've got a pretty good print solution for the university. We say, hey, you don't necessarily need that. When we had kind of our back to school and some of our marketing, we're, we're trying to keep people away from it. We had a few come in though, and they'd want to hook them up to the network as well, and they're just a nightmare. So we, we while we've done a few, it's that's like on our uh, secret menu. Okay. Uh, and I'll field the next one, which is, uh, can we use Windows Active Directory for authentication? Uh, and the, the short answer is yes. Um, I would definitely reach out to a Meraki rep uh, and find out, but as you saw, you could do splash page authentication using uh, Windows, and then uh, depending on whether or not you might or might not want to deploy our MX security appliances, there's other ways to integrate with Active Directory uh, on that end. So uh, to be sensitive to um, Neil's time, let me uh, keep keep the questions coming. We'll capture those uh, for sure. But let me just wrap up the slides uh, very quickly so we can end on time. Just want to reiterate that we do have a full Stack. So we've been talking a lot about the wireless access points. We got to see Neil's network at a really high, quick level. Um, and you guys will get a chance to play with a Meragi access point when you receive yours in the mail. But we also do security appliances. Again, we do switches, layer two, layer three. We have that mobility management solution uh, with systems manager, phones, security cameras. I would encourage any of you who may be interested in any of these other products to attend the intro webinars for them, or even uh, attend the Intro to Wireless webinar, because we would be able to give a much more in-depth demo, I think, uh, given the time. Uh, so definitely check those out. You can go to our website and find ways to register for those there. And then uh, reach out to us if you're interested. Um, there is a way to 
sort of in a risk-free way, uh, test drive Meraki gear in your own environment. Um, we'll pay the shipping both ways. So basically, if you want to do a risk-free evaluation, uh, let us know what gear you want. Let us know how much of it you want. We'll ship it to you. We'll pay the shipping to ship it to you. You can deploy it in your organizations. You can run us against the competition, see what you think. Uh, and then if you are, for whatever reason, unhappy, we'll pay the shipping to take it back. So uh, totally risk-free. Uh, and then again, we will be reaching out this week to confirm shipping addresses uh, and eligibility for the for the free access points. So just keep a lookout for that. And that is the end of the slideshow. Um, Neil, I might just give you one more question, and then I'll see what I can field no, that's fine. Uh, on my end, so that way you can get going. Um, let's see what we have here. So one question is, uh, are staff BYOD or are they using managed devices? And if managed, are you using Meraki Systems Manager or a different uh, MDM solution? Uh, yeah, we, we, they, we aren't BYOD and we, we aren't using a Meraki. We're just, we, we basically, we're, we're Windows heavy with, with some Mac, but we're doing pretty traditional uh, uh, device management type things. No, no Meraki. Okay, awesome. Um, so I know you needed to. Uh, yeah, no, to, yeah. I'm sorry I have to take off. I, I'm on to a, to another meeting. But I, you know, thanks everybody for, for listening. Ho hopefully it was somewhat informative. Like I said, I just wanted to help out. I am a real person. You know, I don't just play one on TV. A real network guy. <laughs> uh, you know, IT manager in higher ed. And I'm not here to, to show for Meraki as much as you know represent what turned out to be a pretty good solution. For, I mean, it's actually a great solution for our institution, uh, you know, and I highly encourage people to look at it. Uh, you know, it's it's good. It's really a strong product. So, uh, you know, again, I'm not even a paid endorser. No, I'm just thank you for volunteering. average guy. I'm just an average guy. All right. Thanks, all. Thank you so much, Neil. Really appreciate yeah. it. Bye-bye. Cool. And then uh, we do have other webinars scheduled, but let me try to field one or two more questions. Um, one question, okay, yeah, that, that we get quite often is, you know, what happens if you lose internet connectivity? And I, I do want to address that because um, I don't think I did in the presentation. So uh, if your LAN connection goes down and you lose internet connectivity, right, we're a cloud-based networking solution, what happens is your network will continue to operate with its last known configuration settings. So your SSIDs will still broadcast. You know, your access to local print and file sharing and stuff should still be okay. Of course, you cannot get out to the internet at that point. And often, uh, that's okay because you're on the phone with your ISP trying to figure out why your internet connection went down. You're not trying to, like, tweak a firewall rule necessarily. Um, however, if you did misconfigure your Meraki equipment and that's what caused your connection to um, go dark, there are ways of logging into Meraki equipment when you're directly connected or directly associated to a wireless SSID. So there's special URLs you can go to um, once you authenticate and log in. There is a very, very basic level of functionality uh, that is designed to help you get back up and running in case you misconfigured a VLAN or misconfigured your DHCP settings or, uh, you know, your, your negotiation fees for your Ethernet cabling and things like that. Um, so. That is the answer to that question. All right, and I'm getting the <laughs> I'm getting the cutoff that we need to stop so we can do some other webinars. Um, but I hope I hope this was interesting. I hope this was useful to you guys. Uh, again, thank you so much for your participation and your questions. You made this a great session. I hope it was useful to you, and I do hope to see you guys again soon at a, another Cisco Meraki webinar. And otherwise, have a great day or evening or morning wherever in the world you happen to be. Thanks so much.